Welcome everybody to our exchange on transatlantic relations and the uh, geopolitics of digitalization. When Joe Biden took his uh, oath of office in January 20, 2021, Germany and the EU um, and all of Berlin were eagerly awaiting to a revival um, and build back better of transatlantic relations and cooperation. And I would say um, that there are lots of areas in which uh, this was and is absolutely necessary. But one area in particular is uh, the digital economy, where different approaches to digital taxes, competition policy, new technologies, platform regulation, content moderation, and many, many other issues deeply influence our relationship. They can bring us closer together or they can divide us. There was great excitement, and there is still great excitement, um, about a new institution which has been founded, the EU-US Trade and Technology Council. And digital issues um, and cyber are very high on the agenda. And there are really also quite a few good signs um, that we are getting closer together, for example, the compromise uh, on data transfer. And we are just weeks away from the next TTC meeting. Nonetheless, if we are looking at different regulatory approaches and different legislative trains in the EU um, and the United States, we still need to discuss if we are really uh, finding common ground or if there are still differences we have to tackle. Um, so we want to talk about the nature of our relationship how reliable we are really as partners, where we need to find closer cooperation, where we need to be honest about differences and how to overcome them. And also we want to talk a little bit about Germany and its role in the EU um, and um, also in relationship with the United States. Before we try to tackle all these questions and many more with a stellar um, panel, a few words um, about this event. First of all, I want to thank Microsoft Berlin for partnering with us, um, uh, with Aspen Germany. Um, this event is part of a series on European sovereignty issues. We have been partners for quite a while now, and it's always extremely enjoyable doing this together. So thank you so very much um, for this event as well. Um, I also want to say that um, all our participants, you are very welcome to be as active as possible, and you can do so by participating through the chat function. Unfortunately, I cannot call on you to bring you in live into the discussion um, that we are going to do next time when we are back on the ground, um, which we couldn't do this time because, unfortunately, um, of COVID. Um, but please participate through the Q&A function, and I will make sure that your questions will reach the panel. You can also um, follow us on social media. Please uh, 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 tweet um, and post on this event. It's highly appreciated. Last but not least, um, I also want to share um, the regrets of Parliamentary State Secretary Daniela Kluckert, who had to call off her participation short um, time, given the certain, certain circumstances we are currently in politically and geopolitically. I think we, have, um, we all understand that uh, politics uh, and participation of, um, of politicians or administrators is rather uncertain uh, right now. Having said this, we nonetheless have a wonderful panel um, for you here today um, with great um, experts on digital issues, cyber issues, information, uh, media, um, and technology. And let me first introduce Tobias Bachele to you. Um, Tobias is a member um, of the German Bundestag, Alliance 90 the Greens, and he is Obmann for the Greens in the Parliament's Digital Committee. I tried to look up the word for Obmann. I really didn't find a good one in English. Um, I think you are the tr um, liaison person for the Greens um, in the Digital Committee, but maybe you can explain your role a little bit uh, more fully in the discussion. You have a background in political science, um, languages, history, and culture um, of the Middle East. Um, you have done media studies. Um, you, um, you are well, well um, familiar and an expert on all digital issues. Um, and we are very much looking forward hearing from you and also hearing what the debates currently are um, in the Bundestag and what priorities um, the Greens are getting into the issue of digitalization. 
It's also a great pleasure um, to welcome a good friend um, of mine and of, of Aspen, Tyson Barker. Um, Tyson, you're the head um, technology and global affairs program, German Council on Foreign Relations. Um, you have been with Aspen until um, October or September 2020 before you joined um, DGRP. Um, you are pu publishing widely um, on the topic. Um, everybody, look up his uh, publications, they're really wonderful. Um, and um, you um, have also held different uh, positions um, in, in politics, um, so you bring in both perspectives, uh, the real world, political decision making and also um, academics. Um, it is also a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Marianne Janik. Um, she is Chief Executive Officer um, of Germany Microsoft. Um, Marianne um, has held her role um, of area vice president heading Microsoft Germany since November 2020. Previously, um, for more than five years, um, she was general manager for Microsoft um, Switzerland, um, having joined Microsoft in 2011. And uh, Marianne, you, um, you are strongly committed to digital transformation and you have a very strong focus on innovation, trust and education. Um, and I think these are topics very high um, also on the political agenda. So thank you so much, not just for being here, but also for hosting us. Um, today and very early in the morning because um, you are here from the United States. And so is Vivian. Vivian Schiller is Executive Director Digital from our mother board or mothership, so to say, <laughs> the Aspen Institute United States. Um, Vivian G uh, Schiller joined the Aspen Institute in January 2020 as Executive Director of Aspen Digital. And um, in her previous life, Vivian, you held lots of very prestigious position um, in media, um, including the global chair of news at Twitter, general manager in New York Times Com, um, chief digital officer um, of NBC News um, and chief of the Discovery Times channel. And it, could, it goes on and on and on. So thank you so much um, for being here today as, uh, as well. So I would love to kick off our discussion today with a warm up question. And I would like to ask all of you to answer short and snappy to it. Um, and then we get back um, a little bit deeper um, into the discussion. So what I would like to start out with is, is with asking you um, in what way digitalization um, has been elevated over the last, well, few years, but particularly the last month to become a political and even more geopolitical and cultural issue. Um, and I would love to start with you, um, Tyson. Well, thanks so much for the invitation. And this does feel like a homecoming. Um, I am really delighted to be here with Aspen and Microsoft and Tobias, all good friends. Um, let me answer it short and snappy. I mean, in the past couple of years with COVID, with uh, geostrategic competition between the US and China, we've seen a securitization of the tech domain. Um, it has become a frontline area of geopolitics. And uh, Putin's war on Ukraine has made that all the more acute. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Tobias. Um, yeah, thanks for having me as well. Um, I would say that, uh, first of all, looking at digitalization, internet supply chains, data infrastructure, it simply is a global topic. But um, as, as Tyson already mentioned a bit, um, the question of dependencies, we, we got used to dependencies regarding energy dependencies, and we've seen how that worked out. And I think this is something which uh, is driving on the geopolitical um, agenda to, to yeah, aspire to those, those dependencies. And one last part, um, when when it's about our own standards and values, I think we can not only trust on, on forcing regulations on products as a requirement to import them to Europe, but uh, when it comes to protecting human rights and privacy standards worldwide, this would, will only work by providing those standards through certain services and products elsewhere by exporting them. And I think this is a very important part when we talk about Digital policies on a geopolitical framework are not only dependencies, but they're also a huge yeah, potential to, to facilitate people's life and to protect and provide human rights. Thank you so much. Um, over to Mariano. 
is building on what Tyson and Tobias have said. And thanks for having me early morning. Um, I think through COVID, we've all seen that digital and digital technologies in general are really mission critical for our societies. And that's why I would say that digital technologies, infrastructures related to it and, and services are certainly mission critical assets. And that's why they're also mission critical geopolitical assets. And of course, as such, you know, politically very relevant. And to make it very short, digital technology are becoming even more technology um, um, critical. And that's why it's it's not surprising that policymakers are responding to digitalization with the full range of beans within their toolbox, policies, laws, diplomacy, and what are we are currently obviously observing what's been there before is that you know this is being extended is as well into military operations. So I think the topic is really key and it's really good to have this discussion today could not be more critical to have that discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Marianne. Vivian. Yep. So, uh, so many great points have already been made. Um, but let me just say, uh, if there's, if, if one thing has been proven all the more true in the last six weeks since the war has started, is that digital media is just is both a tremendous blessing and, and a tremendous curse uh, at the same time, and that. Uh, but uh, maybe maybe most surprising of all is that um, that we may see an acceleration of the fragmentation of of platforms. So the notion of sort of globalized communication um, is a, is a vision that uh, that may be reversing itself. Thank you so much, um, and we make sure to come back to this point um, in the further discuss discussion. Um, before we get uh, to the issue of, I mean the the current situation, Russia's uh, war on Ukraine and um, how cyber and media plays a role in it. Um, I wanted to come to you, Tyson. Um, you have been following the TTC very closely, um, from the thinking um, about the TTC to the um, agenda points on the agenda and also over the course of the last year. Um, could you tell us a little bit more, not, not all our participants are so uh, deeply involved as you are. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what is on the agenda, how has this agenda also changed over the course of the month, um, and what can we uh, maybe expect from the upcoming meeting? Um, sure. I, I'll, I'll try to keep it short and sweet because there's so much involved in the t in the Trade and Technology Council, which is a new, um, as was mentioned, a new institution that was founded to latch up the United States and Europe more closely on uh, economics and uh, and technology uh, policy because of the recognition that both are, again, getting back to this, frontier domains in geopolitics. And I'm going to say something that the Commission would never say, or a lot of Europeans wouldn't say in the past, uh, officials, but it was about how to uh, have a common approach to China. What has happened in the past six weeks is that the chronic challenge of China in the technological and geoeconomic domain has been also complemented by the acute challenge of Russia. And so what we can expect for this next upcoming meeting in Paris, uh, which will be taking place on the 15th and 16th, is how uh, the two sides can work together to have the instruments at their disposal to match challenges effectively, effectively when they arise and as they have arisen in the case of this invasion of Ukraine. I can tell you right now, um, just on the, there are 10 working groups, it's very technical, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but I, I can tell you that there's a lot of focus right now on a couple of specific areas. One is supply chains, uh, which has always been a, a critical focus, uh, specifically related to uh, semiconductors, to magnets and critical materials, much of which was imported in the past from Russia and Ukraine, um, and from uh, on solar panels and the issue of forced labor usage in the production of solar panels in China, and particularly in Xinjiang. Uh, another area that the two sides are cooperating on quite intensively is AI regulation and standard setting. Both are going through a process of thinking about how we um, create governance for artificial intelligence in all sorts of areas, from low risk to high risk, 
And so it's a good time for both sides to be working together on this. Uh, and another area that, that's a real win for the TTC is on dual-use export controls and FDI screening, but particularly dual-use export controls. In fact, I talked to some people in uh, the White House last week. Uh, by the way, Margarita Vestager, the executive vice president for the European Commission, was in Washington last week planning for the second TTC meeting in Paris. And they said, you know, without the TTC, we would not have been able to get this effective regime together on both sides of the Atlantic to deal with things like the imposition, sorry, this is very nerdy, the imposition of the foreign direct product rule, uh, the US's instrument to deny intellectual property on cutting edge technologies to Russia, the entire country of Russia. In the past, that rule has been implemented on companies like Huawei, but never on an entire country. And the ability to work with Europe was enabled by the TTC and the relationships that have been built in these working groups. So when they're working in the boiler rooms, even if it's just practice dry runs, that's perfect, perfect for, for the case of a crisis. A final area that I will mention, and I'm sure there are many more, but, um, well, two final areas. One is development finance. Um, I think we're going to talk about this in this session, that the real, the battle that we're, we're fighting with Russia and China and global techno-authoritarianism isn't just a battle of the global north. It's a battle for swing states in the global south. And I think that that is increasingly becoming uh, a present uh, challenge for both sides of the Atlantic, both in the information domain and in the in the hardware and uh, let's say ICT domain. So on the on the hardware and ICT domain, the two sides are talking about can, rules and principles for development finance of ICT infrastructure, be it data centers, be it mobile network equipment, be it undersea cables and the like. In the information space and disinformation, there's also a lot of discussion about how can we make sure we have a clean, open, global information environment uh, that isn't poisoned necessarily by war propaganda, for example. It's more difficult in the United States because it has different speech traditions, but those conversations are actually progressing. And so that's an area to, to watch for in the, the May TTC. And I can go into detail in the, in the next round, but I'll, I'll stop there. Great, thank you, uh, Tyson. Just one follow-up question: um, Is there was is there strategy behind choosing Paris? So I always thought it would be Grenoble because Grenoble <laughs> is the center for uh, research and development on artificial intelligence and semiconductors in France, but uh, Paris it is. Uh, you know, I I don't know to be quite honest. I mean, Paris is of course just such a hub of innovation that it, it makes a lot of sense. You can get a lot of people to and from Paris quickly. That's always useful. And of course, having it at, um, at, the, at the ENS Paris uh, Soleil is of course, you know, highlighting one of Par uh, Paris's and, and uh, France's innovation hubs. So I, I think that's the primary reason, but uh, I couldn't tell you. Great, thank you. And Paris is always worth a visit, right? Um, and maybe even more after the election. Um, who knows what the uh, outcome is going to be? Um, one one thing which I mentioned in my introductory uh, remarks, uh, a sign of a really positive sign, um, is the compromise on uh, data transfers. Um, data is so important for the transatlantic um, economy, for any kind of business, um, for any kind of service. Um, if we can't get that right, um, it is going to be really hard in the future. Um, but there are already critical voices, even though the compromise hasn't really been public uh, published uh, yet. Um, Mariano, could you explain a little bit more to us um, the dimension of data in the transatlantic relationship and what you are expecting from that compromise? Yes, I mean, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge that we actually now have this fundamental agreement in place because there were so many voices who actually doubted that, you know, the EU and the US would actually be able to agree on, on this matter at all. And, you know, I think the timing also um, of the announcement is certainly not a coincidence. We are currently observing all of us sort of a political revivification of the transatlantic partnership and more generally also um, a renewed acknowledgement of the importance of, you know, 
these kind of sustainable political alliances, but also on the platforms you need uh, to have to find common grounds and looking at, you know, the ability to exchange data, both for companies um, um, for on both sides of the Atlantic is obviously crucial for doing business together. So I think this is a, an important signal to the whole transatlantic community that even on this kind of, I would call them thorny issues, um, such as defining, you know, the, the mutual principles of um, how to, you know, even government have data access. I think that's important because also these things are changing. We see a lot of governance, governments in the EU, you know, have the same approach that the US has. So I think it's important to find these common ground and to collaborate on it. Uh, and of course, you know, we, we're not naive and um, the details of the agreement have not been published yet. We know that what the UK has done with the US and this agreement will absolutely as very highly likelihood that it will be, you know, subject to legal assessments from member states, private persons, or even, you know, at um, the, the European Court of Justice. But I think what I sense and we sense that there is a political will to really look at these issues and build the basis and also work on, you know, finding the common values um, underneath such an agreement. And I think Microsoft as a company working on both sides of the Atlantic and also globally, obviously, um, I think for us, it is also a, with our track record that we've always been trying to find these common grounds and also, you know, um, be the ones who really translate what is needed to to make business. Um, that's this rule of law we have now, and we'll see what's in it. That can be enormously important, not only for business, but also for you know clarification on everything. And we, I'm sure, we're going to talk about cyber. Um, these are topics we need to tackle, and data transfer is is certainly one foundation. And I think we're now here, and we're very curious, obviously, to see what uh, the agreement contains. I think we are all very curious to to, to have a look. Um, and I also um, I would agree that most likely it is going to be challenged again. Um, and this is not the end of it. But nonetheless, it's a good step in the right direction, right? That the partners at all could find a compromise. Let us um, turn a little bit to the issue of um, information, disinformation, um, the role of social media and also um, what role that plays in the current um, conflict. And I know, or war, and I know, Vivian, you have worked on this. I am also um, monitoring our chat, and there are already a lot of questions coming in. And two, I think, are very much also directed to you, Vivian. Um, Joanna Bryson, who is a professor uh, for digital issues and cyber AI, um, you know her from yesterday, um, asked if this is really... Um, in parentheses, just a war on Ukraine or not a war on the West um, and much broader because the activities of Russia started much earlier. Um, that is uh, the first question in, in, in the chat. And the second one is, um, this is not so much to you, Vivian, but it still would be interesting to hear from a US perspective if you think that Germany is ready to reduce our dependencies um, on autocracies, China um, and Russia in digital issues, not just energy, but also digital. It's just, it's, it's also really interesting to hear your perspective. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure I'm the best qualified person to talk about uh, the mindset uh, in Germany, given all of the experts on this call. Um, so, okay, there's there's a lot there. Um, uh, I, I can, uh, Joanna's question I can answer uh, very quickly and easily. Uh, she basically uh, answered the question uh, in posing the question, which is, is, uh, is, is this a war just on Ukraine or is it on the war, a war on something larger? It, it, it is clearly the latter. Um, I want to come back to sort of issues of transnational, but let me just take a brief sidebar on, on that one. Um, 
uh, without a doubt, um, you know, I, I, as I've uh, as I mentioned on a, on a in a in another program we were doing um, yesterday, I, I lived in what was then the Soviet Union for five years in the 1980s, and if there's one thing that is consistent from then to now, it is a general sense of um, Russian, and I mean this not, I'm, I, I please, I'm not trying to paint all of the Russian people with a broad brush. I'm really mostly talking about, you know, uh, leadership, but a sense of, um, you know, uh, uh, that we will not be, you know, humiliated, we will not be any, seen as anything less than for our greatness by the West. And so this kind of, there obviously the, the Ukraine situation is incredibly complicated. But without a doubt, one of the elements is this is our rights, and um, you know we dare you to stop us, and this is part of our this is part of our empire, and uh, woe be it to anybody else, um, any of our neighbors, uh, to try to do the same. Of course, this has tremendously backfired now that um, uh, Finland and Sweden are looking to join um, um, NATO, and you know it looks like Ukraine may be you know expedited into the EU, so the whole thing is potentially backfired. Although. You know, I think it's we we need to carefully watch. Well, we already know what's happening in Belarus, but um, we need to uh, carefully watch what's happening in Hungary and Poland. I think those are the big tells. Uh, but anyway, let me let me. Can I just take a step back uh, for a second and talk about uh, generally um, information? What we call information disorder, which is um, a slightly broader lens on mis and disinformation. It is the entire ecosystem of of information. And we have seen played out, playing out in this war, um, trends that are are not new, um, but maybe the 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 war has sh sh uh, shown a bright light on them, which is uh, information as both, and I mentioned this in the open, as both a weapon um, and an incredibly powerful tool for good. It is so much easier, you know. We all carry these in our pockets, and. The fact that we can now provide eyewitness testimony, anybody in Ukraine um, can do that, um, that it is so easy to uh, reveal the truth of, of what is happening and that uh, forensic journalists like the, like the, the, uh, like the folks at uh, Bellingcat, who just do such uh, amazing work, and at other uh, news organizations and civil society organizations all, all over the world, who are able to look at media assets and either um, uh, uphold them or debunk them um, uh, in the case of, of lies uh, is just tremendous. But so, too, is the ability for um, mis- and disinformation to spread. This is especially true with what's playing out inside Russia, where, um, you know, a pretty impenetrable Iron Curtain is descending once again, worse than it was during the Cold War, worse than when I lived there in the 80s. Um, uh, with the levels of paranoia that we probably have not seen, justified paranoia, by the way, for people um, ratting out their students to their teachers, neighbors to neighbors that we haven't seen since the era of Stalin. So, uh, again, digital media is both um, the, 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 the cure and the disease. And we can go more into more detail. I just want to say one other thing, because I'm already holding the floor for too long. You know, on the topic of, of, of transnational uh you know, cooperation or, or or lack thereof. Um, when it comes to there's really something interesting playing out when it comes to information technologies. There's a great irony that um, Europe is so far ahead at looking at regulating mm -hmm. uh, big tech. Most of them, big tech companies in the United States. And so many of us in the United States look to Europe <laughs> as, uh, as, as, as creating these kind of frameworks that are not politically possible in the United States. So it's a very, very um, interesting dynamic. And it also, I, I also just, and again, I'm more teeing up issues because there's, we can go so much deeper on all of this. There's also a very interesting cultural differences that are playing out in the discussions and the proposed regulation around big tech between Europe and the United States, and this tension between free expression and privacy, um, which is a complicated, complicated debate uh, and set of trade-offs in any case. But I think we are seeing that there is perhaps, um, you know, arguably, and again, I'm painting this with a very broad brush, sort of leaning more towards 
privacy issues in Europe leaning more towards free expression issues in the United States. And that's going to have a tremendous impact as we see what the U.S. government positions will be in these issues. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and happy to pick up any of those threads, but curious what others have to say. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, and I'm sure that we come back to uh, the priorities um, of the Biden administration and what's going on um, in Congress. And uh, Tyson can also jump in in this discussion as well, I'm sure. But let me first now um, turn to the German Bundestag voice, um, Tobias. What is on the agenda um, of the Digital Committee? And in the very few weeks in which the uh, traffic light coalition has been um, uh, in power, have the priorities already shifted? I wouldn't say that they shifted. I mean, there is a huge um, focus, of course, on digital infrastructure because um, we have to admit that we are lacking behind at certain points and quite lacking behind. Um, and I think if we want to provide a functioning ecosystem, we need to put a lot of work into that. But I would say, and this is the very positive thing, that this new government acknowledged from the very first day they were in office or when they were negotiating that digitalization is not about having fast internet or that it doesn't end at that point. And I mean, in our collision agreement, we wrote that we want to have an active digital foreign policy for a global open internet and a consistent EU digital policy. And I mean, that became even more important, but I would say it was on the agenda already before. Um, and one, one part that also plays a role in that, that cosmos, I would say, is that the digital committee actually got upgraded. We, we are now a committee which actually is, um, in German you say Federführung, so responsible on the first, first row um, for certain digital uh, policies, which wasn't the case in the last legislatures. Um, and I would say when, when, of course, we have a huge European legislative package of acts um, that are trying, like you have the European CHIP Act, you have the AI Act, the DSA, the DMA, these initiatives will set a new standard that will follow you more human-centric use of technology, how to protect from manipulation and misuse of social media and create also an AI environment or or hopefully creates or gives a good ecosystem for, for uh, businesses to create AI in a non-discriminatory way. Um, and all those are necessary if we want to stand for our values. But um, when it comes to, 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 to the coalition, to the government, we, we also want to push that further. We want to strengthen the open source approaches with the Sovereign Tech Fund, which we um, is one of the key projects for the next four years. Um, we also want to push for more data sovereignty on an individual, individual scale, but also push the open data approaches in Germany and yeah, create an ecosystem for, for data-based business models in general, not only AI. Um, and I would say that's, that's, as I said in the first statement before, I think it's very important to not only rely on the Brussels effect, but also um, try to push for innovation created in Europe, which we are actually able to export them, and not only rely on regulating other businesses from from other countries. And I mean, that now brings us a bit to the to the transatlantic relations, because I would say, um, at certain points, of course, we share a lot of values. Um, and, and we are partners in, in a good spirit, um, but on certain points, and I mean, it has been said before, I think Vivian was it, that there are different priorities with that. And I would say, as much as we are valuable and highly appreciated and core democratic partners in those all those goals, I would say that the question of having a new privacy shield or whatever it's going to be is very important. And I'm saying this because it was mentioned that there are some skeptical voices about this um, this new initiative or this new um, deal von der Leyen and Biden struck. And I would also be skeptic about that because what we cannot what would be very bad, let's say that way, for that core partnership is if we have just another paper which will not stand European jurisdiction. 
and will be gone within a few months or a few years. And I think this is something, I mean, Vivian, I think said it before, we are, we believe as a Europeans that, that privacy is one core value in sustainable and human rights based digitalization. Um, and I'm still curious and I'm still waiting for the relevant changes in US law and methods um, to actually believe that this will be a sustainable deal um, and this deal will will bring us back on a on a level where we can actually rely on each other and work together and also businesses can rely on each other throughout the transatlantic uh, markets. Thank you so much, uh, Tobias. Let me also uh, let me then also post the question which uh, Florian asked in the chat, um, and he uh, pointed at the U.S. had warned us um, about high dependencies on gas um, and oil from Russia for a really long time. Uh, the United States also warned us for quite a while um, regarding the dependencies um, of Germany and the European Union um, on. Uh, products and inputs from China. Um, I think the EU is moving a little bit into the direction, um, seeing that threat more serious. But um, is this something which is discussed in the Bundestag? And are we now serious about diversification, reducing vulnerabilities? Has it sunk in? Sunk in? <laughs> Yes, I would say resilience is one of the big uh, keywords you, you hear a lot right now. Um, resilience, of course, on all scales. But as someone who, who, who started or who talked last year a lot about, well, we have those dependencies in oil and gas. And well, if we now start towards renewables, this is a big bonus point. Not only it's a climate issue, but also it's a geopolitical issue. And I always try to use that to, to compare it to the digital dependencies we have on a hardware scale, but also on a software and programming and all those um, yeah, uh, scales where, where, where distribution is, is taken globally. Um, I would say, yeah, that is sinking in, and I would not only say people are shifting towards it in a, in a broader resilience uh, approach, but also I think there are, let's be honest, there are a lot of people who still don't got the call, um, but many of them, on the other hand, realized, well, we can't make the same mistake twice. I mean, we, we've done this, the last mistake with energy dependencies for at least 30 years. Um, having that, uh, having paving the roads, which brought us to where we are now. Um, and I think maybe people don't realize it fast enough, but many people do realize we can't wait another 30 years uh, on another dependency um, and, and just have the finger crossed that everything will go well. Marianne, um, you were nodding um, a couple of times. So resilience, I, I'm pretty sure, is a big topic for you, for Microsoft as well, right? Yes, absolutely, because, you know, <clears throat> working um, globally uh, as a company, having to comply and, and really also thriving, obviously, to comply to all different national regulations and being a critical infrastructure in a lot of countries for us as a company is really a company. We are deeply, you know, thinking about these these kind of things. and. Um, what we see, and I think there is this this positivity about this Brussels effect that was mentioned, um, especially on GDPR, and that's something as a company we could really translate very well and very early in the process to offer these standards to all our customers on a worldwide basis. So this is something that really helped us. On the other hand, you know, I see the trend at the moment um, in in Europe and in especially coming from Brussels to sort of lead by regulation and I think and that's what we see now there are certain boundaries at a certain time because you can't rule the world by regulation at a certain time you need platforms to cooperate you need to to really go deep into these complex topics because everything gets complex you need these corporations with partners like the US and you also need to find the right balance between um, regulation corporations lot to do with trust and values with understanding where people come from so um, I think for me personally also is um, the situation at the moment 
I think there is something for all of us and, and you know, as business leaders, that's what, you know, we have been doing and our customers have been doing, talking about, you know, how much do I understand technology? What is actually a real dependency? What is not? And I think this is the discussion that's coming up now, um, especially when it comes to, you know, how to deal with data, how to deal with digital technologies, to have a far deeper understanding um, before, you know, just leading by regulation. And um, at the end, you know, also between Europe and the US and other parts of the world, there's going to be cooperation, but there's also going to be competition. And that's something that we see also in the business world. There's a word for it, even co-opetition. And I think that's a reality also we need to embrace. Mm -hmm. So um, at the moment, I think we have the right discussions, but we should really stick with the discussion and not, you know, after the Ukraine war is over, to just, you know, forget about it, because it's a complex matter. It will need constant attention and constant dialogue. And that's uh, why it's so good to have the TDC, um, I guess, especially after yes. the four years of Trump administration, where um, there was very, very little progress on any kind of integration. Let me come um, to the issue of um, to, to an issue which uh, Tyson, you earlier on said, it's a little bit nerdy, um, but nonetheless so very important. Um, and these are technical standards um, for existing and new technologies. Um, I still remember during the TTIP negotiations, um, there was a, I mean, a big negotiation part looking at technical standards, divergencies as, as big NTBs, non-tariff barriers in the transatlantic relationship. And it was extremely hard to get anywhere um, because as soon as, as soon as standards are established and they diverge, it's so difficult to um, to get to mutual recognition or harmonization. So the idea of the TTC is um, to develop joint standards for new technologies, um, to not even in the beginning have those divergencies. So Joanna is also uh, or has asked the question in the chat. Why is suddenly everybody interested in standard setting issues um, in comparison to the past? Um, and another question was, can we actually uh, expect anything out, out of the TTC on standards? Because we do, as we just heard from Vivian, um, but also, also a little bit from Marianne, there are different approaches to standards and we do share lots of values, but there are also differences with regard to values. So Tyson, the look into the uh, tea leaves or crystal ball, will the TTC deliver on standards? I mean, it's it's definitely a high bar. Uh, standards are always difficult, but it's much easier to uh, have convergence. And I don't think that there'll be there won't be harmonization, but there'll be convergence on standards set on both sides of the Atlantic. If you can do it, a you know before <laughs> before uh, you know the the die is cast to some extent. There are path dependency issues, so it's easier to think for you know future. Uh, future facing than it is to try to re reinvent the wheel once it's once it's been invented. I mean, the the, the thing about standards and on on AI and uh, I'll just talk, let me start more broadly about the geopolitics of standards. Um, there has been a challenge in capacity on uh, very boring uh, technical standards issues in international standard setting bodies in the past couple of years because China's. Uh, state-owned enterprises and state-adjacent enterprises have invested a lot of uh, capacity in technical expertise uh, in flooding the zone with model standards, uh, setting themselves up to take chairs of uh, working groups in specific areas like mobile network equipment, um, taking the uh, governance bodies and things like ISO and the ITU very seriously, and at the same time, there has been a an atrophy of uh, participation by private sector actors. I'm sure Microsoft is very, very active, but some of the traditional uh, actors that have been involved in in leading on standard setting, like telecommunications, have have drawn back. So a lot of the the where they have drawn back, a lot of Chinese companies have kind of, who are you know very much affiliated with the Chinese government have filled those gaps. 
And the thinking is, uh, by smarter people than me, including my colleague Tim Rulik, is that we don't necessarily know what kind of backdoors are being designed in these kind of technical standards, because you can design all sorts of uh, security vulnerabilities by design in the way you set standards themselves. So it's, it is very nerdy, but that is one aspect. The other aspect, and I think this is something that also companies are aware of, especially US companies in the transatlantic context, is that the European Union has is moving in a more state-centric direction when it comes to standard setting, as opposed to being more multi-stakeholder, where there is permeability for the private sector to impact and influence the way standards are set at SEN, Senelec, and, and, and uh, the standard setting body for, for telcos. So that is something that is also that we need to be very careful about, uh, because our state's the best uh, locus to set standards, and how should that conversation occur also within Europe? Because, again, Europe in the past has had a massive role in, in setting global standards. It has diminished, but it still has a, a an important role. I mean, you can think back to um, uh, the standards for, for telecommunications, you know, uh, in the 90s, where Europe, because of uh, where cell phones were made and where cell phones were used, Europe set the global standard. That's no longer the case, um, and that has all sorts of geopolitical implications. On AI in particular, uh, you know, the NIST is currently going through a massive uh, AI risk management framework drafting process. They are looking at things like bias. Uh, obviously, the EU is having is drafting and passing now the AI Act. There's going to be a huge amendment process. It's a live piece of legislation. And ideas around things like how is risk um, assessed, risk assessments, how is explainability assessed, what is bias, all these kind of questions. What is applicability? Is it, it based on impact? Is it based on sector? These are questions that uh, that it's better to tackle now than uh, <laughs> once the, the regulatory frameworks and then beyond that, the standard setting frameworks have kind of been set in stone. So uh, I, I, I hope that is uh, somewhat of an explanation. It is, is a very tough topic, but this is really a fault line where, where China has been very strategic in how it has seen capacity across the board as, as a place where it can gain leverage. And if it is that kind of technical standard setter, it's going to have a leg up when it comes to exporting, uh, you know, across its partner countries. So we want to make sure, again, getting back to kind of European uh, ideals, because, you know, we're in Europe, and we're having this discussion here. One of the primary ideas of Europe is to maintain freedom to choose. Uh, interoperability, data portability, the idea of connectivity. And you want to avoid, you know, lock-in effects uh, by fit of absent-mindedness or cybersecurity vulnerabilities by fit of absent-mindedness. And I think that that is what the TTC and other uh, uh, dialogues are trying to anticipate. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Tyson, for explaining that to us. Um, we um, we know that there are lots of uh, legislative trains in the EU um, either have have already arrived um, or are still in the station or on the way to being passed. We heard about the DMA, the DSA, the DGA, the Data Act, the AI Act, the Chips Act. Wow, I mean this is. Oof. Lots of lots of things going on at the same time. Um, there are also um, lots of initiatives in the in the U.S. and Congress um, on similar issues. Um, Tobias um, and also then to Marianne, um, do you see convergences or do you see uh, differences? And one one of our uh, participants is asking specifically, and that is that is uh, Johannes Tim from SWP Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik, um, an expert on U.S. Uh, US uh, foreign policy issues, asking specifically if there is convergence on, regula on regulating big tech um, in the EU um, and in the US. Tobias, divergence or convergence, what do you think? I think it's both. As I said before, I think the, the privacy shield is some kind of a cornerstone where we will be seeing what direction that's going to take, whether it's 
Well, we are core partners on the paper and, and on the front line or on the he headline. Um, and whether now speaking on a very European German politician um, perspective or whether the United States are actually willing to to take their their stand more towards the European Union. Um, and I think depending on how that's going to take out, it's easier to 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 say that um, in general. But when it comes to regulating big tech, I mean, we see that um, it has been mentioned before that many are in the United States are looking actually to the DMA and to the DSA. I mean, we in Germany, we are having a very different stand towards that. And when I say we, I don't I'm not as much talking for myself, since I'm not a biggest fan of the Netzwerkdurchsetzungsgesetz. But um, of course, the German perspective sometimes, or, or some of my colleagues would even say, well, with the DSA, we, we are having a new approach to something we have done before. And I, I would say that's very good, because our approach hasn't been the best. But um, of course, this is, this is a diff very different perspective from the US, which hasn't done uh, that approach or hasn't gone that path yet, and is rather watching the debate around the DSA and the DMA as something very frontier, very new. And I think there we have at least some voices who are pushing for for conversions and to, to alignment with, with those regulation approaches. But I'm still very skeptical and I would also say, but I'm happy to to hear from the others what what they are thinking about that that the window of opportunity for actual coming together in the United States regarding the elections is, is very, very small. Because because when it comes to to very um yeah, when the when the election campaigns really start, everything will will be watched very closely, and the the idea of uh, sellout towards Europe, uh, I don't think the GOP will will react very positive on that. And I think there's a lot to figure out and very unstable debates uh, going on. So I believe that's that's a huge debate, much viewing towards Europe, but I'm very skeptical about how actual policies are going to come out of there. To be as a follow-up question, um, because I'm not sure if uh, especially also our um, US viewers know what the Netz Durchsetzungsgesetz is and why you are not so keen on it. Could you explain that? I believe that the NetzDG, as we say shortly, Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, um, is one the biggest example of how we underestimated the Brussels effect, like the idea of having a, a German regulation, uh, how do you say in English, um, I'm sorry if I stuck there on a very simple word again, but the German regulation actually being adopted by other countries, but we have only planned as far as our inner interior debate went. We believe this is a regulation piece about freedom of speech, where the difference between freedom of speech and hate speech and and false information and and not well information is going to be. Um, but we relied on on a jurisdiction system that is independent, that has a well um, debated approach on on how that is measured, what I just described, that line between hate speech and freedom of speech. Um, and what happened was that many authoritarian states said, well, that's a great approach. We are going to take that. But the idea, for example, what is going to be terroristic content is very different in Germany, in Europe, to, let's say, Egypt or um, best example, which is praised or used a lot, is Turkey. And we are criticizing Turkey for punishing platforms, but also individuals for what we believe is just political freedom of speech. But they are now saying, well, but we're doing the same thing as you're doing. And therefore, with a legislation piece, which did make sense a lot in Germany and also worked more or less, let's let's no go, not go into that part of the debate, but which is debatable, but worked somehow. Um, became a piece with what with with which yeah with 
we we lost our moral high ground in the international debate. And um, I believe this is something which was the first time we really realized that having an impact on a global digitalization and a global market is not only a good thing. Marianne, um, maybe you can also come in both on the convergence diversions, but also on the issue of uh, information disinformation. Yeah, I would be with a lot of things that uh, Tobias said. You know, there, there will be, and this is part of the, the process, and we've seen it now with the Privacy Shield coming back, there is conversion, there needs to be conversion if you want to cooperate, but there will still be differences. And um, I think that's something um, that can be overcome also in the sense to create far more clarity on a lot of things because today we're talking about big tech you know not really making a difference looking at the the business models big tech is having so big tech is not always equal to it's not the same so i think looking at conversions and diversion to have this proper dialogue and that's why we need those platforms to have those contacts and also these experts and all the the standardization as well to really because the world and especially technology is is extremely complex and to have these kind of expert talking to each other finding common ground and also um you know working together on on some of the differences um, how to communicate and how to create clarity around them. So I think that's a muscle we can train now. It's nothing easy and uh, leading with regulation, as I said, you know, comes to a point where this does not work or this just creates then different interpretation in different parts of the world so that we need to live in this world that is going to be different but will need conversions and that's standards are all about that and um today we also talked about you know open source that's something that we as microsoft really highly welcome on the other hand what i can observe in some industries that um, in Europe and also in Germany, a lot of companies have a really hard time um, to comply or to, to get the, the principle of open source, you know, right. And again, it, it comes back to, um, do I master technology? Do I really understand what it's all about? Or do I just feel completely dependent? And that's, I would say, a two-way street and that's why i think the current situation is a huge opportunity to really tackle the thing that is complex and talk far more about the things that we didn't talk about in the last uh, few years or not with the necessary seriousness as well as all the questions you know related to government access to data and what's happening in Europe in in different European countries versus the US, how is the law really regulating the access um, of governments to data? I think there's a lot of transparency to be created and to find common ground. So I actually applaud the situation at the moment and I see all parties really working together. And as Microsoft, you know, for us, it's we are a company, we're just a company, but I think we can contribute with also creating transparency and starting with ourselves, you know, um, showing and, and being super transparent how we comply with different regulations. Thank you so much, um, Marianne. To move now from also the standards setting and convergence divergence debate um, a little bit more into the debate on information disinformation and the disinformation um, ecosystem and we, how we deal with this on both sides um, of the Atlantic, especially in this 
um, time of geopolitical competition. Um, Vivian, I know that this is an area where you and your team are working on um, in intensely and deeply. Um, what have you found uh, so far on that issue? Um, are you happy with what the government is currently doing? <laughs> Which government are we talking about exactly? <laughs> oh, the blanket answer is no. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll come back to this. Can I just uh, can I just reflect just very briefly on a couple of other things that um, some of my uh, colleagues have said, uh, and, and it's related to mis and disinformation because everything that I care about is related to mis and disinformation. So no surprise, you know. Uh, Tobias was talking about how rules can be interpreted in different ways in different nations and, you know, how do we define a terrorist and all of that. A, a really rich example of that in the world that I come from, which is journalism, is, you know, there have been over the last couple of years various proposals in terms of sort of criminalizing, maybe, maybe not criminalizing, but, but you know, it, uh, it, it, un invalidating, unvalidating, uh, you know, so-called fake news, which we know is a terrible expression, but falsehoods on social uh, platforms, and that you know, fake news should be should be should be stopped. Uh, literally, some of them are about criminalization. And just you know, the the interesting thing is that we have seen certain countries create uh, anti-fake news laws. and But what has happened is it becomes a weapon, a cudgel for autocratic leaders to say, therefore, I am going to take control or I'm going to suppress an independent free press because their interpretation of what is fake is something that they disagree with, some criticism of the government. And so it has been used as an excuse to crack down on a free press. And we know that this is a crisis that is growing. We are going in the wrong direction when it comes to comes to a free press. So, you know, it is once again a caution about be careful of seemingly on the surface sensible things like let's make fake news illegal. Well, fake to whom? And so it's really, really complicated. I also just want to say, sorry, one other thing, um, two other quick things. One. I want to double down on what Tobias was saying about the political environment in the United States in terms of getting anything done. I, I would put it at 0.0001%. You cannot overestimate uh, the political fracturing in this in the United States, where I live, so in this country, and when, where I am right now, um, uh, particularly with regard to any kind of regulation around the platforms. Yes, the, uh, the the far end of the GOP, the Trump, I will call it the Trump GOP, um, and um, and the left both agree that they that social media platforms um, cause a great deal of harm and they are broken. But once you go behind that 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 common cause, the remedies vary wildly. Uh, and again, to be you know to speak really at a at at, at a ridiculously high level. Um, you know, the, to, to the far right, it is about, you know, suppressing, suppressing speech. But, it, you know, the, the fig leaf is expression free, ex is suppressing free expression, but it's really about um, allowing, um, you know, bigotry and, and calls for harm and all the kinds of things that we see that got many um, uh, politicians, including, uh, you know, the president of the United States banned from Twitter, that that should be, that that is free expression and should be allowed. On the left, we're looking at uh, the kinds of harms that are caused by a lot of speech. So those two things are never going to meet, and and I don't see that happening anytime soon. So um, I also just the third point. Sorry, I've been saving these. So third point I wanted to make is I actually want to applaud Microsoft um, among so, or sort of so-called big tech. Sorry to jump you, uh, dump you with big tech. Uh, big tech for um, a lot of their policy and approaches to this work. I think has been a breath of fresh air in terms of support for, particularly around journalism, the kinds of work I'm seeing out of the digital democracy work at Microsoft. So I just wanted to say all of those things. Huh. Your question now is, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> remind me, or would you rather I... <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I mean, this, no, no, actually, this is, this is all feeding into what I ask you. Um, yeah. Um, especially how the uh, how the Biden administration and also Congress are trying to tackle the issue um, of disinformation um, and um, and 
misinformation and right. also hate hate yeah. speech. Um, then uh, also, I would like to hand over again to Tobias um, and Tyson asking the same question, just for the German European side, and if this is a topic which should be discussed in the TTC. Yeah, let me just say one thing, and then before they speak about the about the the, the U.S. Um, environment. There are things, and we I, I will put a plug for that, we created something called the Aspen Commission on Information Disorder last year, which looked at tackling, coming up with actionable solutions, not pie-in-the-sky solutions like Congress will suddenly get along, but actionable solutions to not solve mis- and disinformation, but at least get at a set of solutions very much focused on what is actually possible. And there were quite a few recommendations to government that we that they that are now in various stages of discussion that includes legislation that would allow uh that would uh, both uh, both force and allow because it's it's complicated uh, uh data collecting platforms to share anonymized data uh with um academics and with qualified academic institutions and news organizations to sort of understand what's happening the roots of what's happening um, and also to create uh, more uh, uh, convergence in the federal government, because issues around uh, mis- and disinformation, information disorder, right now are scattered throughout agencies. Recommendation is not to create an entirely new agency, but to create sort of a center of gravity, uh, because a lot of these groups are simply not speaking with each other. And there's a number of other recommendations that, that again, are under consideration, and I, I will share a link to the full report in the chat. That would be great. Thank you so much. Um, Tyson, is that an issue for the TTC? Uh, mis- and disinformation? I, I would say, of course. I mean, we'll, uh, and, and I think not only should it be, but it is. And I think it's an area that they think that there might be some problems, but I think it's very, very nuanced. Um, and it involves, let's, uh, I'm going to use a buzzword or something, buzz term, regulatory ecosystem. So if you look at, for example, the structure of the uh, Digital Services Act, which is currently being negotiated, there are questions about trusted flaggers. So can you have outside um, uh, experts, NGOs, civil society, also monitoring enforcement, and also, um, you know, looking at the way that uh, community rules in terms of services adopted by in that case, very large online platforms are actually enforced consistently. Because one of the issues that people have had after uh, January 6th and after uh, what has been happening with RT and Sputnik is that these are political decisions. There is very little legal underpinning. And because of that, there's a lot of inconsistency. It's kind of a form of selective enforcement, selective justice. And even people like Angela Merkel last year after the decision by the platforms to deplatform Donald Trump and others said, well, you know, what, what is the, the actual legal basis or basis in your terms of service? And what is what made the difference? Uh, it strikes some as um, a bit uh, arbitrary. And so what the, the DSA tries to do is say, you know, we're not going to tell you what to do, but we are going to tell you to enforce your rules. Um, and so one of the, the mechanisms for that, sorry, I'm getting a little technical, but uh, is to see how the European Union's uh, code of practice, the European Democracy Action Plan's code of practice can actually be enforced consistently. So if you look at something like what's happened right now with RT and Sputnik, Different platforms have taken very different policies on how to manage that. Should that content be throttled? Should it be monetized? Should it be, uh, you know, deplatformed in certain regions like Europe? Should it be deplatformed globally, as Microsoft has decided to do? You know, and all the different big players have taken di very different stances. And I think that what the U.S. and perhaps Vivian can also talk about this has said, well, this is very interesting. You know, not we don't want to because these these spaces are very. They're gray spaces. Are they public spaces? Sort of. But they're also private spaces. So how do we make sure that the rules that they set are actually being enforced impartially, rather than the government coming along and saying, well, you got to take this down because it's RT and we don't like RT, that kind of thing. Um, so, so I think that that very, very difficult conversation about enforcing rules that actually exist within these platforms is one that is taking place within the TTC. 
if I can just say one more thing about the United States, because I am an American and I watch the U.S. pretty closely. Um, on all these issues, I completely agree with people who say that Congress is not going to be uh, and, you know, congressional legislation will probably not be the answer to all these areas of potential convergence. The areas, the, the centers of of convergence are regulators using existing authorities, uh, like the FTC on, on artificial intelligence, like HUD looking at discrimination in housing, uh, financial services regulators, executive authority, and that is very um, politically charged because, you know, the White House can swing back and forth. Uh, but if you look at things like the AI Bill of Rights, for example, private sector actors very much dri driving, uh, you know, governance in these spaces, including, and just think about AI, but including Microsoft, IBM, uh, other, other corporates, but also the civil society. Um, the national security community, very important uh, in this space in the United States, I would say more so than in Europe. And then, and this is quite important as well, subnational state actors, specifically cities and states, because they are, I know it's a cliche, and but it's one that <laughs> there's a program at Aspen Germany based around, which is laboratories of democracy, um, but they are at the vanguard of, of setting governance for, uh, for these digital spaces, including things like AI, like facial recognition, et cetera. So Congress, maybe not the place to look, but these other areas should be. Tobias, I saw you nodding a couple of times. Yes, I mean, I mean, Tyson perfectly explained the DSA approach, but I would say why I was also looking away and thinking a lot, because I, I, one part I would say, which is still a gap in our approach towards disinformation and disinformation campaigns, is that I would say one huge problem which we have is not tackled by the DSA because it's the tendencies of the big platforms towards closed groups. And we've discussed that in the last few years about dark socials and mainly about the questions, what is private communication and what is public communication and therefore needs to be regulated on another scale. Um, but I think for that part, the DSA gives quite a good solution. I mean, we discussed it in Germany around Telegram. But the missing part of organic peer review, of, of um, public discussion, discussion around things, and having on the other hand, fake or, or finstas or whatever, let's, I don't like to, to use the word bots, but when, when using bots, it's not about having automatic, uh, automatic uh, fake profiles, but also used fake profiles. Um, to amplify certain certain narratives. And now we have the problem that certain, or I would say most platforms, and even TikTok as the platform, which has not the group function that much, but is for from the algorithm itself designed as some kind of group or, or closed ecosystem or, or, or uh, you, you stay in the group where you have a lot of common common um, values. I think this is a problem which we are not tackling right now um, and which is going to stay. And putting that together with with the problem, as I said, that that fake accounts or, or however we want to name it, but controlled accounts with a certain political agenda um, are used to amplify certain voices and therefore have a false balance, at least in certain corners of, of public uh, information systems. I think this is a problem which we still need to talk a lot about. Um, and is also currently, I would say, one of the most dangerous parts, because when we take a step back and think again, what is this information about? And now talking about disinformation campaigns, what are they about? It's about, first of all, amplifying narratives that either confuse the broad public or at least a certain target group, or that weaken the alignment with a certain group. And I would say that's something we currently are witnessing at that day and yesterday with the idea that Steinmeier wanted to visit Kiev. And of course, it's an important part of information, and it's also 
I would say, in my opinion, it's it's. I, I would not complain about them declining the 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 idea to visit, but of course we can discuss about that. But now amplifying that narrative will put a critical point between the alignment of the German public opinion with the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. So therefore, this information and it doesn't have to be fake news. It's not a false information is a very important part and we need to be very careful and it's still a huge place where we need to discuss a lot about how we are handling this amplification of certain parts whether they are true or not of narratives and i think um yeah this is now rather and an, an very occurring problem than a solution where i would say our current approaches are are not enough but also where we might be except the regulation won't solve it for a hundred percent and we need to to see for other um um ways as for example having high standards and well equipped uh, journalism which is then once again a big problem in the day of uh, in the days of social media platforms yeah, thank you so much. Uh, time is running. Um, and I really also wanted to touch upon an issue um, which we briefly um, started to talk about in the beginning of our discussion. And this is uh, cyber vulnerabilities, but also cyber warfare or the role of digital technologies during wars. And um, just wanted to share a couple of numbers also um, with, with you and our audience. Um, and um, uh, the cyber operations tracker of the Council on Foreign Relations um, found that 34 countries are a bit be before um, Russia's uh, invasion in Ukraine um, were already suspected of uh, sponsoring cyber operations, um, with large majority coming from China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. Um, and uh, the think tank recorded 76 operations in 2019 alone. And when we are looking at the number of cyber attacks, um, then um, the World Economic Forum says in 2021, malware and ransomware attacks, attacks increased by 358% and 435%. And um, those are very costly. And there's an estimation that um, in the next uh, uh, five years, um, the cost would reach 10.5 trillion US dollars annually. And these are just costs incurred to companies, not the cost incurred to democracy <laughs> and, um, and to values um, and to freedom of speech and so on. So um, let me ask you um, and uh, start with um, Tobias, um, Tobias again. Is this, is this a topic which is currently moving up in the agenda in the Bundestag, um, talking about cyber and warfare and how to react to it? Yes, I would say, first of all, on a very positive part, it's what I meant, or it's a big part when we're talking about resilience. I mean, resilience is not only about um, having supplies and everything, but also being able to to react to um, attacks and and to to yeah have have the harm reduced. But. I'm not happy with some approaches um, that are taking when it comes to the question of a more active or more responsive um, cyber cyber uh, cyber or reacting to cyber attacks. Um, I would say that the vast majority, although some important people from our coalition partners uh, have stated differently, are still declining the idea of hackbacks, of, of, of having more offensive um, cybersecurity system, simply due to the fact that this can easily spiral um, escalations, which are not our intention, but are not all, are also not, uh, not, not to be controlled anymore. And, and uh, therefore, I would say that there's still a very strict line between um, strengthening our resilience, strengthening our defense systems, but uh, not going into the idea of, uh, well, we strike back and then the problem is going to be solved because 
I believe, and I would say many of my colleagues believe, uh, that this will harm more and cause more problems than it, it solves, or at least the chances are very high that that's going to be the case. Marianne, I'm sure it's a huge topic at Microsoft, right? Yes, it is. And it's been for years, actually, because as you know, we are operating a huge infrastructure around the world. And um, for us, you know, an attack being a nation state or whomever is an attack. And we've started many years ago already to to make significant investment in in uh, and and that's also contributing to fighting cyber attacks and disinformations. And um, what we do um, is certainly publish our annual digital defense report, which summarizes all the insights from our by now 8,500 security and cybersecurity experts. Because we, we have on our infrastructures, we have about 24 trillions of daily signals we are receiving and we can work with. So um, a topic, I think, especially before the Ukraine war and also now, we've seen that this is not solvable by by one company protecting the world or even one government. What we see and this has happened and is happening, that we need this dialogue, this exchange of information, um, because that's going to help everybody. So I feel we need something like public-private partnerships with certain actors to especially anticipate attacks. And obviously, Microsoft, we have nothing to do with any kind of cyber offense. We are completely just in the part of protecting for our own infrastructure, but our customers as well from these kinds of malicious attacks. And most of the attacks today are coming from nation states. And I think that's something as a society, also as a global community, we need to ask ourselves if this is something we really want to continue to accept. Vivian, um, Marianne just said, and I think very rightly so, this is a global problem, which needs a global uh, answer, or at least an international answer. Um, so let me pick up one of the last questions from the chat. Is, is it the right approach to have a TTC just um, to, to talk about these issues in a transatlantic sphere, or should we take on Canada um, and bring other um, like-minded countries on board or make the TCC uh, even a G7 uh, initiative instead of just keeping a transatlantic? Uh, oh, uh, certainly. Uh, <laughs> certainly. Look, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be expert on what that changes to the, polit to the dynamics in the group, but um, I think uh, Canada is a, is a critical player here, and um, certainly there are other... Um, other nations that have deep lived experience with these issues uh, whose voices should be heard, whether it either in a formal or an informal and informal setting. Um, that said, I do understand that, you know, if we if we move towards a full United Nations approach, uh, the chances of getting anything done um, decrease exponentially. Tyson, what do you think? Um, expanding the TTC? Well, uh, you know, I think that there's value in in different types of constellations with different actors. I mean, the the fact that other countries are interested in in participating, not just Canada, but also Japan, very interested in, of course, the UK, very interested. But each one brings their own issues, their own priorities, and to be quite frank, sometimes their own baggage um, could dilute the effectiveness of bringing these two unique global rulebook making actors together, the European Union and the United States. And to have that as, as a core for this dialogue, I think is useful. It is also an indication that people want to be involved, you know. There are other, uh, you know, other formats, including the G7, where these topics are also addressed and that can feed into the TTC process and vice versa. For example, on, on May 10th and 11th, uh, the G7 will be holding the digital ministerial. I would be very curious to know what's on that agenda, 
because I, from what I know or what I believe, the agenda is not as ambitious as the TTC agenda. I think they want to look at cybersecurity capacity building and some issues around internet governance. But there's a whole list of issues that that, that ministerial could address, particularly in the context of this Ukraine crisis. So, and then, and then somebody asked in the chat about the uh, declaration on the future of the internet, which is slated to be launched on April 28th. Um, there are a lot of strengths in that uh, document. I've seen the document. It emerged from the Alliance for Democracy or the Summit for Democracy uh, that the Biden administration hosted in December. Um, but there are a lot of questions as well. First of all, you know, what is the private sector multi-stakeholder buy-in? What is the value add of having a document that champions uh, multi-stakeholderism that's drafted only by states? And second, you know, what, what kind of buy-in do you get for something like that from the Global South when the like-minded states coalition that, that worked on it primarily are the U.S., Europe, Japan, Canada, South Korea, the Global North, the, the OECD countries? So there are all sorts of ways. You're always dealing with trade-offs between eth efficacy and inclusiveness. But that's why we have several different formats, and I think that that's the best approach. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, really unfortunately, we have to come to an end. Um, although we only were able to scratch on the surface on, of some of the issues, maybe raising even a little bit uh, further questions than answering all of them, which we posed in the beginning. I would like to close with a um, final round. So fast forward a month, and this is um, after the TTC met um, in Paris, and you look back at the meeting, when would you say was the TTC a success from your point of view? And when would it be, would it have been a failure? So let's start with Tyson. When would it have been a success and when a failure? Well, I think it will be a success if it releases a, a statement as packed both with deliverables, but also uh, ways forward as the Pittsburgh statement. So if it did something very meaningful, which I think is 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 possible on uh, dual use export controls, on AI standards, uh, on uh, supply chains, uh, particularly around chips, uh, solar panels and critical materials. I wish they would do even more on critical materials, but perhaps that's something for the, the G7 to tackle. Um, and on disinformation, I think we'll have a meaningful uh, TTC. Um, the, I think it would be a failure if we have a statement without concrete deliverables uh, and without a, a direction forward. We need forward momentum into the third TTC. We all know why why this matters, what's at stake, especially after what has happened in Ukraine. Um, but we have to make sure that these kind of processes work because that's what gets principles, you know, these uh, very important people uh, together to, to huddle around these strategic issues. And to huddle around these strategic issues, they need big ideas. And so we just got to keep those big ideas that are concrete, keep them coming. Great. Thank you so much. Mariana. Yes, I would completely rely on, I think we're running really out of time. I think we need to see that, you know, we are on the verge of really, you know, making some meaning, meaningful decision in this world that, you know, needs to be clear that there is cooperation, but there is also competition, and this is going to, to be with us. So having the first concrete results based on the on a good um, discussion, not ignoring that competition is there and values are sometimes different. So I would see that as um, a great step forward. Thank you so much, Vivian. Uh, it's a little bit of a sideways answer, but um, one of my biggest concerns is that um, uh, th th this war uh, in Ukraine will end soon, in, inshallah. Um, let's hope so anyway. Uh, uh, I am a little bit worried that when the hot war dies down, that a lot of the things that we have seen and learned and a lot of the momentum around cooperation will begin to, people have short man memories and it will begin to wane. Yeah. And so let's keep this moment of, of uh, the, the, the nations on the side of right sticking together um, alive. 
Thank you so much. And last but not least, Tobias. I, I don't want to contradict all the checkpoints that have been made, but I would say uh, it was a success if the Privacy Shield successor, which is going to be hopefully presented, uh, the details or the details are going to be presented around the TTC, is um, a sustainable solution. And there's a chance that uh, within the US there are the, the 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 relevant changes are to be made. Um, but the other way around, I think, and that goes a bit in the direction that has been just said. I think a failure it would be if there would be a framework talking about is this information because that's the public interest around the war that it's currently raised without actually well with with having a nice that we talked about it and it's important that we talk about it with, without actually having rich on content um discussion on it so so having just a uh yeah the idea that nice we met about it and we talked about it but we don't have any approaches towards it i think that would be a failure and uh, of course it, it also goes to other topics but i'm a bit afraid that this information might be used because as i said it's a public interest mm -hmm. So thank you so very much. I think we agree that we want action, not just words. Um, thank you so much. This was a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much to our partner, Microsoft, to our wonderful speakers, Marianne, Tobias, uh, Tyson, and Vivian. This is something we want to keep on continuing. Um, thanks so much for our participants sending in all these very interesting questions, which I hope we almost fully answered. And sorry if we missed a couple, time was running out. We will continue this dialogue. Come and see us next time when we do it on the ground. I wish you a good remaining day for everybody um, in, in the United States and a good evening here over in Europe. Thank you so very much and hope to see you soon and healthy. Thank you.